every uh, weekend on Sunday mornings, you hear primarily Pastor Tilden as he hosts our various gatherings, just remind people, particularly for our guests, because we have new guests every week, so we just remind people what our vision is, what our focus is, which is to reach people who feel far from God, make disciples, build families, and transform communities. And uh, this is one of the ways that we are seeking to deliver on uh, our uh, goal of building families. And as I thought about this last night, uh, <laughs> We're not just building families by helping you with your marriages, but we're also making disciples. Uh, because if you read through the New Testament, as Jesus teach about what it means to be a Jesus follower, uh, at least 50, there are at least 50 one another's. Everybody say one another's. Amen. Throughout the gospel. You know, love one another, forgive one another, encourage one another, spur one another on. Uh, Rejoice with one another, cry with one another. And here's the point. Being a follower of Jesus is a whole lot to do with how you treat one another. Amen. Right? And those one another's are often about being inside of the church community, but if Jesus was here, he would say, no, the one another's actually starts with husband and wife in your family. So if you're doing great with the one another's out in the world, but you're not, you can't handle the one you live with, this is a discipleship growing moment. This is about becoming more like Jesus. Nothing helps you become more like Jesus in marriage. <laughs> and it is also transforming communities because we are convinced that if, in fact, you allow God to have his way in your marriage, that impacts the next generation. Your children and your children's children. As a matter of fact, some of the challenges that you have is a result of stuff that went wrong in your parents' life and in your grandparents' life. But Rhonda and I are both here as, re as, as witnesses of two things. One, we were saying this when we were coming up. No, was just, we were praying for you guys who we were driving up. And we said, God, uh, you know, we really are praying for miracles because we know all of the times over the last 30 years that you worked miracles in our lives. We wouldn't be here, guys. There were tons of moments when we thought it's over. Let's just figure out how to settle the business and exit. But we're here because God is a miracle working God. Can we celebrate that? Praise God. All right, so we're praying for you guys. Lord, thank you for today. We're, you're certainly here. We just want to acknowledge your presence again and just ask you to be God and have your way. Surprise us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, last night we got started and we asked the question. Let's throw the scripture up on the, on the, on the, on the screen. Uh, let's read the scripture together. Also, get rid of your anger, hot tempers, hatred, cursing, obscene language and all similar sins. Uh, today, we're still trying to wrestle with this question, well, where did this stuff come from? How did it get into our relationships? And last night, we told you that one of the primary places it comes from happens to be uh, from our broken past. And we, we covered all the different ways in which our past often sneaks into our present. And we are completely unaware that it's our past that's influencing us. And Rhonda and I gave you an example of how that worked. Today I want to cover the second point uh, because uh, oftentimes uh, anger and cursing and the way we feel about one another comes from our broken past, but also it often comes from our, what I want to call dead dreams. Everybody say dead dreams. Dead dreams, dead dreams are expectations that will not be realized, or fantasies that we bring into the marriage, these fantasies that we, we expect to live out in our marriage, and at some point we realize that, that, uh, that they're just not real. Let's throw them up on the board. Let's go through some of these uh, examples where they are in terms of broken dreams inside our marriage. First is, is uh, oftentimes our dream or fantasy or expectation dies when the image of your partner is broken or destroyed. It's, 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 it's uh, uh, oftentimes when, for example, if infidelity shows up, totally destroys. Or you find out that 
one or the other of the partners is uh, engaged in pornography and it just shatters. Uh, or maybe there was a huge fight that broke loose and it became physical. You never would have thought that it would have become physical, right? And all of a sudden, your image of who this person is is totally, totally destroyed. You go to bed with an angel, you wake up with horns. I mean, <laughs> your image of your family life, broken and destroyed. Uh, you dreamt of of raising a family where you're close to your kids. In fact, you're not close to your kids. There's fighting and so forth that's going on. And you dreamt of a family where, where you'd have vacations together and Christmas holidays, but it just doesn't happen for uh, job patterns and so forth and so on, and it's totally shattered. You've never acknowledged, but you're, it's gone. It's shattered. Ah, oh, the realization that your partner now is different from the one who you marry. They've changed because you've discovered something about them that you didn't know, or they've changed because something has happened along the course of time. They've, they've, they've changed because maybe there's a physical illness that takes place, there's a stroke or something, or uh, they've changed because mental health emerge, issues have emerged that you didn't know about before uh, you got married. They've, they've changed because the two of you have gone through a trauma together. Maybe you've lost a child, for example, and it totally has shifted their dynamics. Of, uh, of who, uh, who, each, who, who you are to one another. Or one of you have gone off to war and come back. A variety of ways. The person that you met, or they've changed because you learned something about them after you got married. You just had no idea before. Next, the realization that your partner will most likely never fulfill your most important expectation. This is a big deal, right? Because our, our fantasies and dreams that drive us into marriage often comes out of places uh, in our history where these are things that we never got. Or these were things that were robbed from us. And we were just waiting until we met the right person. Because we just believe if I can meet him or if I can meet Mrs. Wright, I, I can live this thing out. And, 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 and you have awakened sometime in the last few months or over the course of the last few years, and you realize that whatever that great expectation is with this partner, it probably will never happen. Now you're like, I'm trapped. And I'll never, ever have that something. It's a dead dream. Did fantasy. Finally, your image of self has been destroyed. Your own behavior inside of the marriage, or some of the stuff that you've gone through, some of the stuff that's come out of your mouth that you thought would never happen, has literally helped to destroy how you see yourself. Or you've gone through a long period of unemployment, for example, and it's destroyed how you see yourself. You, you begin to think of yourself more of a failure. Or you're wrestling with your own physical health or your mental health. And, and, and it has totally shattered how you see yourself. You think of yourself in pretty ugly, horrible terms. You may not say it but you feel it, you believe it. As I said earlier, Rhonda and I have lived through all of this, and uh, so here comes Rhonda. Actually, for the rest of the conference, my goal is to show you exactly how Herman and I worked through one of our major challenges uh, in our marriage. And it's a work in progress, but I think we are, we're pretty much there on this issue. Um, so I chose work-life balance um, because in the beginning of our relationship, that was the biggest issue that kept causing so many arguments and disagreements. And so last night, I talked to you about thinking about the different challenges you have in your marriage and picking one that you want to hold up, that you want to try to process through. And, you know, the idea is that you'll have one that you process through this weekend, but then you can use the same pattern to process other challenges. Um, so for us, it was work-life balance. And um, many of you know already from previous times that I've talked that I 
graduated high school early at age 16, and I went to college. And so I met Herman um, one month after I turned 17. And I actually met him the very first day of college. And so he was a senior and I was a freshman, and we've been together, been together ever since. But before I went to college, um, I had a goal in mind. And my goal, if uh, many of you don't know, was to get my, does anybody know what degree I was after? MRS. My, my Mrs. degree, okay? My, my sole purpose of going to college was to get married. In fact, the way that I chose my college was based on a commercial that I watched when I was... <laughs> This is the problem of bringing your baby brother. <laughs> so when I was maybe 15 or 14, um, Coca-Cola had a commercial out and they used the Grambling um, marching band. And I thought, you know, they had all these fine black men in uniform. <laughs> and I just thought, after I watch that commercial, I screamed to my mother, I found my college! <laughs> and I kid you not, I applied to one school. <laughs> that is it, Grambling State University. And I met my husband the very first day, okay? Now, I bring this up now because I, br I had this whole fantasy of what my life was gonna be like. And Herman was sort of dropped into this fantasy before I even met him. He just had to fulfill certain characteristics and then he could fit into my mode of what my perfect family life was gonna be. And when I got to college, you know, a lot of people make their, um, their college schedule based on when they study the best, you know, like morning people will have their hardest classes in the morning and people who are like night people will have their hardest classes in the evening. Well, for me, since I was there for the task of getting my MRS degree, I made my classes, my class schedule around when Young and the Restless was playing. <laughs> So Young and the Restless played from 11 to 12 every day. And so that meant that I definitely couldn't have any classes from 11 to 12 because I had to watch Young and the Restless. And then you don't really want to have one from 10 to 11 because you might miss the first few minutes and then there's really no classes starting at 12. So really that whole, and no one's getting up at eight. So that whole morning schedule was pretty much off for me because of my Young and the Restless. Uh, and why did I love Young and the Restless? Why did I not miss a single episode? Because I had built this fantasy of that's how married life was. The wife falls out of bed, beautiful. <laughs> clothes are always perfect. And you never see her putting on makeup. She's just beautiful naturally. And what I really loved about it is her husband might be the CEO but they have three hour during the day conversations about the kids and you know what's going on in their personal lives and nothing is ever rushed. It's always take your time, drink coffee, talk. And really, Herman set me up. <laughs> he played perfectly into this fantasy I had because when I first met Herman, he literally swept me off my feet. And we would take long three, four hour walks, hiking in the park, holding hands, talking about, you know, you know, talking about our childhood, talking about the things that our parents did that we would never ever do, and we're gonna do things differently. And I'm telling you, I had this fantasy that I was gonna be this wife that my mother always kind of um, put in my in her own mind and in my mind that this is the life you know the the sort of the beaver cleaver type life the Cosby type life where you have the wife at home who is making sure the home fires are burning the house is always clean the kids are respectful and smart and doing well and everything works out perfectly 
And I tell you, the reality just slapped me in the face. <laughs> I think, you know, it happened so fast because um, many of you may not know, but the very first day that Herman and I arrived in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, where he had his first church, um, I was nine months pregnant, and that's when I lost the baby. And so, you see, on our way to, um, to Arkansas, the whole drive there, I had this whole, you know, I was leaving my family and everything that I knew, and I had this whole dream, okay, we already knew what the house looked like. It actually had a white picket fence around it, you know, and I thought, okay, so Herman's going to be starting, um, becoming pastor of his first church, and I'm going to make sure everything's good at home, and I'm going to focus my, all of my attention is going to be towards Herman and this baby, and so I had this whole thing, and then we went to go deliver the baby at the hospital, and I got the news that the baby did not have a heartbeat. So right there, the very first day that we arrived in Pine Bluff, my dream went splat, okay? Everything, not only that, okay, imagine Herman's place. So here he is, fresh out of seminary, first church, wants to make a good impression, wants to know what God's call is, those are going to take hours of meetings. And most of our parishioners work during the day, so most meetings happen at night. And at night is when, and Young and the Restless, everybody's at home eating. <laughs> you know? And so it was a real disappointment to me that I would spend all day making these fabulous meals. And then 5 o'clock comes, 6 o'clock comes, 7 o'clock comes, and no Herman. You see, this, my dream, I had created and concocted for years. And in that dream really was a whole lot of what we talked about last night. What came into that dream was dreams of my mother, influence of my stepfather, all of the things of my childhood. And so I brought all that to bear into the relationship and here comes Herman. He, he's innocent. He doesn't know all of these things that I'm expecting him to do. And when, when reality set in, that, you know, the truth was basically I'm in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. That's a lot right there. <laughs> <laughs> No offense to people from Pine Bluff may be watching this video. Please don't put any of this in your feedback to us, okay? For me, it was difficult, okay? Because I was born and raised in San Francisco, okay? And I was born and raised in a home, you know, before my mother remarried, she was a foster mother. And so in our home, we had... Um, she took in girls, and so we had white girls and Asian girls and Latino girls, and I grew up in a melting pot. That's what my home was like, because my mother was a foster mother. She always wanted to stay home and be home with us, and she said that's a job she could do and still be home. And so going from that to Pine Bluff, Arkansas, where everything is split down the middle, that was the first culture shock you know, that I had. And then this whole idea of my husband being home and being there, that was another big disappointment. Then, of course, the loss of the baby. Oh, can't even, that's just huge. So every part of my dream collapsed right in front of me. Good. Very good. Now, I just want you to just take what you've just heard, and just drop it in these points here, right? The image of your partner broken and destroyed, this, this partner who's going to come home for 5 o'clock and be there. And remember, we're all grieving. So I'm grieving. She's grieving. Most, a lot of men, when we grieve, we don't come home. We what? We, we work. We work. Right? So that's what. And, and then coming home to, to a, a grieving wife reminds me of all what I couldn't do to save the baby and to save her. So I'm working, I'm working. So this person who she felt loved her so, so what, doesn't even want to, it translates to her, doesn't even want to be around her. Work is more important. So this whole image of the partner is totally shattered. Who did I marry in the middle of this horrendous grief? 
right? This image of the family life has been totally shattered. Here's our first baby. She was nine months pregnant. She had, had a healthy pregnancy. This is a matter of days before she's supposed to give birth. Can you imagine all the expectation, anticipation, and dreams, and then all of a sudden it's lost? That's shattered. Uh, it's, it's not here, but we should put here huge questions about God. I'll talk about this in a minute. That pops up on the scene like, God, where have you been? What's up with this? We're trusting you, believing you. Boom. So I don't think I can, you know, really what's going on is I'm not sure I can depend on God. Can't depend on my husband. Get me out of here. Total, complete shattering. Uh, so you can imagine the fights that breaks out at home. Of uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I want you to think about this. Think how angry one becomes when you realize that your ultimate dream has been snatched from you. And you cannot have it. And I say anger. <coughs> that fantasy will not happen. Anger. And that's what's going on with some of you. Your fantasy, your expectation that you have when you got in marriage is shattered by a thousand different reasons. And it's gone. And, and the reason why you wake up full of anger is because your dream is dead. And when you look at her, you look at him, he or she reminds you, and you want to say it's your fault. It's your fault. Yeah. So what I had to do was, um, actually, that dream had to be buried. God had to bury that dream, and we had to resurrect a new dream. And that was a painful situation. Um, some of you have heard me give my testimony before. You know that the Lord speaks to me in very dramatic ways, like the way he spoke to me to come into medicine. Um, I don't think I've ever told the story of how God pointed Herman out <clears throat> to me as my husband. So very dramatic. Um, and I think the Lord does that because um, I, you know, because I am so, I'm so dense in a way, you know, because, and I'm so bullheaded and strongheaded that I want it to be done my way. So he, maybe for some of you, you're so much more flexible. But for me, I really think I know what I need and what I want. So the Lord had to be very um, dramatic in the way he shows his will for me. And he did make it very clear that Herman was my husband. And I do not believe in divorce, really. I, re I mean, I know that the Lord gives you that one out, that if there's infidelity that you can, you know, you can be divorced. But I really do didn't ever want to be divorced. I would feel like that was a failure. And I would feel, and I also felt like you can divorce one person, but then what's going to prevent you from marrying another person It's just like the first with a different name, you know? Um, and so what I really wanted to do was really just do whatever God wanted me to do. And so the first thing I realized is that in having this dream of Herman having a nine to five job and coming home and being with me and et cetera and everything being like Young and the Restless, it was really setting him up for failure. Because if you think about the type of job that he has, it's impossible to work a 40 hour work week being a pastor of a, of a church where your parishioners work during the day, you cannot be home at five o'clock because that's when all the meetings start to happen. And so I set him up. On one hand, I wanted a husband who was passionate about his work, who really uh, you know, strives for excellence. And on the other hand, I wanted him to fall into line, don't leave too early in the morning and don't come home too late at night either. And so I put him in a situation where he couldn't succeed. My expectations were actually impossible. There was this um, movie, I don't know if you guys ever watched it, Jerry Maguire. Um, and then there are some great scenes. And I, I, even though I feel like the Lord has you know, mostly delivered me from my fantasy, every once in a while, <laughs> you know, something will come along and I'll just kind of, 
bask in it. So Jerry Maguire was that movie. You remember the, uh, the line, you complete me, yeah. right? And so I was like, yeah, you complete me, you know, so romantic. But you know what? Herman shouldn't complete me. If Herman completes me, that means, okay, as it relates to, um, you know, handling the money, I'm only 25%, so that means he has to be 75%. If you think about it, if someone completes you, whatever your deficit is, they have to be exactly that in order to make a whole. That is completely unfair. We are not puzzle pieces that fit perfectly. We're not Tetris. It's just not fair or realistic to put an expectation on Herman that because I'm an introvert and I like to spend most of my time with me, but I want you home at a certain amount of time, but not too much. Talk to me for, you know, an hour, but then I need my space. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Nobody can be that, uh, you know, that would be a machine or a robot, not a real person. And so, I realized, okay, my dream is unrealistic. I'm setting my husband up for failure. And really, let me just say it, it is not Herman's responsibility to complete me. It is my responsibility to come as whole as I can. And any deficits that I have, I put that on the table as, this is what I need help with. In fact, let's go back to last night a little bit. So as you know, um, my stepfather had a big influence on me. And I have to say, he was quite a brilliant man. He was a linguist. He learned how to speak five lingu uh, languages fluently after the age of 30. He, you know, he, he tested in the, in the IQ range of a genius. This man was actually brilliant. I think brilliant people also can be, you know, everyone has their flaws. And so one of the things that he did was he Around food, like I said, there was a lot of control. And he used to assign value to people based on the food that they would eat. Remember I told you, if we went to a restaurant and somebody put ketchup on her, their eggs, he'd give this look like, hmm, you know, poor breeding. Uh, <laughs> and if we had spaghetti at, at a restaurant or at someone's house, if you mix the pasta with the meat sauce, that's a no-no. You definitely have to have your pasta al dente. That means to the tooth, apparently in Italian. And the, the pasta has to be exactly right. And the pasta sauce goes on top. That's how you eat spaghetti. And if you eat it a different way, you're low class. Now, in my logical, analytical mind, I know that is absolutely ridiculous. However, I bring up that example because I have to actually fight with myself that when I go into Denny's and I see someone put ketchup on their eggs, not to think poor breeding. <laughs> I mean, it is a part of whatever you learn from zero to 10 years old, it is ingrained, it becomes instinctual. So I bring this up because many of you come into your arguments and into your challenges with your mother or your father or whoever raised you in the room and you hold on to things tightly that if you really stepped back, you'd be like, you know what, this is kind of ridiculous. And you could go left or you could go right. There's no right way here. I don't believe there's anywhere in scripture that says it's low breeding to have ketchup on your eggs. <laughs> and so really the word of God has to be Amen. the foundation of everything that I believe. So really, when my dreams, when I allow my dreams to die, my husband is not going to be home at 5 o'clock. He is not going to complete me. I don't get to be a deficit in several different areas and expect him to step up and just exactly right at those areas. Once I allow that immature, selfish dream that really had nothing to do with Herman, we didn't come up with that dream together. Once I gave that up, that's when God was able to call me into what he wanted for my life. Okay. So hold on right there. So let me take you through a text real quickly 
And I want to come back to this place, and then I want you to hear what happened when Rhonda was able to give up this dream. But I want, I want, I want to just show you this pattern in, in the biblical text. So uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 11, one of my favorite passages. You'll uh, be familiar with the story. If you haven't, go home and read it. I'm going to pick up a few verses here, but go home and read it together. That would be fabulous to go back to your cabin or go out and just hang out and read it or read it tonight. It's great. Let me just summarize the story. So <clears throat> whenever Jesus would go to Jerusalem, Bethany was about uh, a couple of miles away. And Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, two sisters and a brother, lived in Bethany. He'd go and, and hang out with them, spend the night with them. And the text reminds us that they were extremely close. He loved them enormously. And uh, as the text unfolds, Lazarus gets sick. And uh, Mary Martha sends word to Jesus. And the word to Jesus is, the one that you love is dying. Meaning, so implication, come heal, come save, come preserve. Uh, and the text tells us that Jesus actually stays an extra few days and never, ever responds. Now, first of all, this is a theological passage piece here, right? Because Mary and Martha, they believed in Jesus. They knew that Jesus could heal. They knew all these stories, all this stuff. So they were just, can you imagine sending word to Jesus? They just know, we can just get word to him. Lazarus will be okay. And they sent word, and Lazarus is dying, and Jesus doesn't even respond. And he stays a few extra days. So... I, I, I relate this to the fact that many of us in our own marriages, we, we have felt it dying. We felt our love dying. We felt so much of dying. And we said, Jesus, come help us. Come help us. And there's no response. Like Rhonda and I lost our baby. Where were you? Where was going? So that's, that's part of the piece. In the meantime, the disciples around Jesus says, hey, we just got the word that, you know, Lazarus is is sick, and then Jesus actually knows when he dies, and he basically says, you know, uh, uh, he, he essentially says to his disciples, well, this sickness will not end in death. I, I think a better translation is because Jesus knows he's going to die. Lazarus is going to die before Jesus shows up. Here's a better translation. Here's what Jesus was really saying. Watch this. This death is not going to end in death. You say it with me. Say, this death, this death will, not end in death. will not end in death. See, one of the most frightening things for you right now, because as we're talking, some of you are saying, yes, that's right. I have a fantasy. I have an expectation. I have a dream. And my whole life is wrapped up in it. And yes, I realize I probably will never live it out. It's a death. And you're scared to death to fully acknowledge it, because what that means is, you know, if, it, if, 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 if I give it up, if I release it, if I bury it, if I acknowledge that it's dead, then what? And you've got to hear God say to you today, let it go. Let it die. Because this death will not end in death. A couple of verses later. Lazarus dies. Jesus comes back. Lazarus has been both dead and buried for about four days now. Jesus comes back in town. The word gets to Martha and Mary to Jesus in town. Watch this. This is around verse 20 through 22. Uh, uh, word comes in. Jesus is here. Martha says to Mary, Jesus is here. Martha gets ready and runs out to meet Jesus. And the text says, but Mary stays at home. I like the Mary. Everybody say Mary stays at home. Here's where Mary is. You going to show up now? You didn't respond. You didn't nothing. He's died and been buried for four days, and you going to show up now. I don't want to see you. Martha runs, and when she gets in front of him, here's the point. Here's, the, here's what she says. Uh, essentially, she says, uh, Lord, if you had been here, my brother, my dream, my expectation, my fantasy would not have died. But, shout but. but. 
even now I know the Father will give you anything that you ask. So, so here's, here's, a, here, here's a point. She's saying, if, even in this tough spot, I still believe you can work a miracle, that, 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 that you, can, you can somehow fix it. All right, a little later, Mary comes out because they go back and say, the master's calling for you. So she finally goes out and she throws herself in front of Jesus and she's screaming and she's hollering, which I love, by the way, because some of you really need to do that before Jesus. You really need to scream and holler. Not at your spouse. You need to scream and holler and say, God, why? You know, just be honest with God, maybe for the first time in your life. And then she says, Lord, and she's screaming, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. However, there's no but. I know the father will still, no, no there's, there's finality for her. There's no, it's over. And so that reminds us that there really does come. So here's two quick points. Listen, I don't care who you marry. And I don't care when you marry. Leave the spouse. You, some of you think, okay, go leave the spouse. Go get a divorce. Go marry whoever you think the right person is. The cycle of your marriage will follow this every single time. Every single time, you're going to go through a process where whatever the fantasy, the dream, the expectation, you have to. It's just a part of the fact that you're marrying somebody broken and you're broken. And you're going to ultimately come to this point where there's going to be a death. Yes. And you've got to decide what you do. Now, ultimately, here's, here's the option. So, 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 so there's a death. Then the text says, Jesus weeps with them, which is a wonderful word. When something dies, you have to grieve it. We have a couple of choices, right? When we get to this point, we realize that something has died so important in our marriage, we can do one of two things. We can A, check out. Everybody say check out. There's a variety of ways to check out, right? You can stay in the marriage but be checked out. I don't come, you know, I'm not coming home. Or I come home and I go straight to the computer. Or I jump right on my, on my phone. Or I jump right into my TV series that I'm going to watch. In other words, I don't really have much to say to you. I don't want to have much to say to you because you're the reason why my dream is died. I've checked out and I've just decided I'm going to live with you till I die, probably for the next 30 years, regretfully. What a horrible place for that to be. Or you can have an affair. That's another way of checking out. If I say check out. I, I stay here, but I'm trying to get, but really that's a fantasy, right? Right? Because whoever you're having the affair with, that's detached from reality. Because they don't have to do bills with you. They don't have to do children with you. Come on, it, it, it's, just, it's just like, it's just living out your fantasy. You're just detached from reality. Or you can divorce. Or you can decide to let it die and believe that God is saying this death will not end in death you can let it die you can grieve the loss of it you have to grieve it you have to acknowledge it it's not coming back it's over I've got to grieve it. I've got to cry. I've got to express my anger. I've got to go through the process of grief. I've got to grieve it. When Jesus says, where did you bury him? Show me where you laid him. Show me where you buried him. Here's the point. If you can let it die and bury it and grieve it, then that sets up the mirror. That's where Jesus shows up at the grave and he Christ speaks into the dead and he says, come out. And something new emerges. Ron's going to talk about that part of her story. Let me just say a couple of words. One is that um, my call from God, as I said, was quite dramatic. And I think many of you have already heard my testimony. 
But I think the main point of it is this. The only, and I've told you this before, that the most important part of my walk with the Lord for me is my obedience to God. And I really believe that if I'm obedient to God, he's going to take care of me. And it was really a part of me being obedient to God that I gave up my dream, my young and the restless lifestyle dream, my Beaver Cleavers family lifestyle dream. Um, and it was only then that God was able to actually speak to me. Yes. And, you know, when he did speak to me, it came from a place that I had no, I didn't put much value because my mother had put such value on the wife staying at home and raising the kids and taking care of the home that when God spoke to me about becoming a physician, it totally and completely threw me off guard. But I was able only to hear it then. Now, maybe God was, maybe he wanted to speak to me before and I couldn't hear it, but I could only hear God's call in my life when I had given up the dream and let it die, as Herman just talked about, and believed in God that, okay, I'm letting this whole lifestyle of this family life that I have concocted, that's in the media, that's in all the fantasies, Cinderella, rescue me, you know, um, and I'm going to let that die, and then I'm left with nothing, like this vacuum, okay, now what? And then God really gave me the now what? Then I was able to hear the now what? And then me and Herman together were able to create a brand new family life structure. That it wasn't just me and he has to fill in a spot that I've predestined for him. But it was really the two of us together saying, okay, what does God, first of all, what does God have for us? And how does God's calling on Herman's life as a pastor and my life as a physician, how does that how does that bring us together? And what kind of life will we have? And that is the beauty of it, that God's plan is so much better than the plan that I concocted. Our life now is so much better than the one, than the young and the restless one. You know, it really is so much better. But I couldn't hear it until God, until I allowed what I wanted to go away, to die. Then God could step into the driver's seat. So, get this as we bring this to a close. You know the text. Uh, if you don't, you'll read it. Jesus says, take me to the grave where you're buried. He goes. There's a tomb. There's a stone roll there. Jesus says, so that they might believe and for your glory, Father, hear this prayer. Then he instructs, roll the stone out of the way. They roll the stone. And Jesus screams. Lazarus has been dead for four days. Decomposition is set in. Lazarus, come out. And then the text, I love this text, it says, it, 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 in my imagination, it had to be truth, right? It, 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 the first thing that has to happen is Lazarus' heart has to start beating again. Some of your hearts have stopped beating. The second thing that had to happen was Lazarus' mind had to come awake. He had to begin to think again and see again and imagine again. Some of you are, you've shut down. You don't imagine nothing new. You're locked in the old. And then, and then, and then, and then, and then it, 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 because they got him bounded, right? And he comes out bound. And then Jesus says, loose him and let him go. Now, here's the point. Watch this. Don't you know that if you died and was buried and had been dead for four days and then suddenly you came back to life, that the stuff you used to fight about before you died is not relevant now? <laughs> Aren't you kind of looking at life a little differently? Yes. Everything is totally brand new. Stuff that wasn't significant is stuff that used to, it's, it's all the minor stuff stays minor. So here was the deal for Rhonda. The moment she was able to let go of her world, her at home, my coming home, et cetera, et cetera, then the Lord spoke to her and said, I'm calling you, first of all, 
she went back to teaching. And she forgets these words, but here's what she essentially said to me. If you, you're going to be doing, you're going to be out there working all that. I'm not going to be standing around here cooking, waiting for you to come home. I, I'm going to go back to school. I'm going to go teach. That's what she said. Now, for a moment, that shattered my dream, because I really liked the fact of having a little lady that was cute at home. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> Work this out. <laughs> You're not going to be home. Who's going to cook? <laughs> but of course, I realized something about everybody shout empathy. I mean, I, I realized that she was in a lot of pain. And so, so, so it, was, it, was, it was just cruel for me to try to hold on to her in my fantasy, right? I had to let her go. I said, okay. We'll figure it out. I'll make oatmeal. <laughs> <laughs> and when I released her onto that journey, why she goes back to school to get... Uh, she ends up ended up doing some teaching at the university campus where we were, which was right across the street. She's getting her two hours away from getting her final degree, masters in, in uh, literature and English, right? And, and, and then the Lord speaks to her and says, no, I'm calling you to medicine. She would have never heard it. Never heard it. All right, so here's what I'm trying to say. Look. You're scared to death to let it go. You're scared to death to acknowledge he's never going to be the man that I imagine him to be. You're scared to death to acknowledge he's never going to be the woman I imagine her to be. And so you think about how do I get out of here? Or you're trying to prop up this dream. You guys remember the, uh, the movie uh, Weekend with Bernie? <laughs> it's one of my favorite movies. I like this. This is such a weird but it's very <laughs> insightful movie, right? Bernie visits and he dies. And, and these guys, they don't want anybody to know that he died with them. He's, 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 supposed, to, he's supposed to be alive. So they, they put him in the car. One of my favorite scenes. They put him in the car. They put shades on him. They put him back and, you know, with the roof tied. And they're driving him around. They want everybody to know, no, he's alive. He's alive. No, he's dead. He's a corpse. <laughs> are y'all, some of y'all are riding around trying to, Hold up a corpse. And the corpse is keeping you from hearing God. Bury it. And then God can say, okay, in these circumstances, with this man, with this wife, in these financial circumstances, I'm going to speak. And I'm going to call something out that neither of you can imagine. If I hadn't let her go, so she'd go back to school, and she and buried mine, and she buried hers, to a large extent we wouldn't be here. We couldn't imagine how our world would change, and she would end up being an amazing doctor and physician, and freeing me to be the pastor that I would become, and how together we'd be here today. We couldn't see it then. Tell somebody, let it die. Now say this, because this death, say it, will not end in death. Come on, give God a hand praise. He's ready to speak. Let me give you your homework. So this sheet gives you the opportunity to Put down in paper what challenge you decided to work on this weekend. So for me and Herman, we would put in the first slot here, um, work-life balance. And you can put communication, you can put you know, more intimacy, you can put parenting skills, you can put whatever you want to put here that you want to really work on for this weekend. And then the second slot is going to be, what is your dream? And that's the reason why the one each helps. What is your dream around it? So I would put here, my dream was to have a young and the restless type of lifestyle, you know. And I knew what that meant. So that's what we put on ours. For you, if it's finances, you may say, 
to accumulate wealth. You may say for parenting to raise children who love God and are respectful. You know, whatever your dream is around it, not to say it's a bad dream, just put whatever your dream is. Fantasy. Whatever your fantasy is, whatever it is, you're gonna put that there. And then this is the part where you have your own stick figure. And you're gonna put what brought you to the place that you are right now as relates to whatever your challenge is. So let's say you put sex here in the lack of intimacy and your dream was you know, to have good sex twice a week with your husband, I don't know, whatever your dream was around it. Then for, for where you are with, you know, you're not actually meeting your own goals, you can put what influenced you. Was it some trauma that happened? Maybe some old relationship where there was infidelity or um, maybe there was some improper touching happen and so now, or maybe it's, this is your one stronghold of power in the relationship and you're gonna use it as a manipulation tool. I don't know where you are with it. I don't know how you came to not be able to meet your own dream or meet your own expectation, but that's what you're gonna put, arrows to that. Broken. And you can, you know, so broken dreams and broken past. And a broken past. Here are some ideas just to kind of spur your memory on the little check boxes at the bottom.